exciting. Sorry, Hamish. Oh, okay, that's all right now. Okay. Um, so we had a lot of different sports that we could take part in, and you'd sort of sometimes take that for granted and realize that when you travel, um, that sort of thing is not always available. And so the other thing I remember um, was when you switched on TV and you watched New Zealanders competing overseas, um, we always seemed to have a handful of athletes who were the world's best. And it always amazed me that how could we be the very best in the world when we come from such a small country like New Zealand? And, um, and like, for example, Rod's marathon, I actually do remember watching that because I remember at the end, it looked like he was praying. And, um, <laughs> and the thing is, it's like there was someone there that was that talked like us, that was like, and he was a New Zealander. But um, it was kind of amazing that for a small country, we can, it is possible. And I think it, you know, um, and, and a big inspiration for me was John Walker as well, because I wanted to be a runner, but I, I wasn't actually that fast. Um, so I got to idolize athletes who were not just the very best in New Zealand at what they did, but they were the very best in the world. And it set me on a path to, to want to emulate that. I think that's your dog. For it's me. not. Um, I'll try and read that one. So... Um, and that's probably what I remember the most is just the fact that uh, when when I sort of left school and started to pursue sport professionally, there was never a sort of consideration that I just wanted to be the best in New Zealand because I'd grown up watching other Kiwis, you know, win on the world stage. And so it was the benchmark that I was uh, willing to accept. And I guess that's what I would encourage you all today is that um, whatever you decide to do, the beauty is of coming from a country like New Zealand, um, you really do have access and opportunities which are right in front of you. And it's really just about grabbing them. And, uh, and that's really a challenging um, approach to take because if you're going to ch uh, achieve something really hard, it's going to be difficult. But um, also in the difficult times is when you grow and develop the most. So I would really encourage you to, to think beyond what's possible and, and really, really go for it and enjoy it in the, in the process. So, so I'm, I'm just going to throw one at Rod. Rod, when, when, you, when you look like you, for what you achieved and, and someone like Hamish mentioning it, I mean, I remember, and I'm not going to call you old Rod, but I remember when I was a kid actually in Thames, uh, we went on some group harrier run. I had no idea what was going on. And there was this old guy called Arthur Lydiard who was, who was leading the run. And, and in that moment, it didn't mean very much to me, um, but, but it, it must mean something to you that, you know, kids are listening, we're, we're talking about it, we're looking things up, you're, you're still inspiring younger generation, Rod talks about you and John together, and I'm sure there are others there as well. Um, and, and so what, what does it mean to you, Rod, to continue to contribute? Well, it's, it's something, and, and I know Hamish had um, uh, quite a bit to do with the Sir Edmund Hillary Trust. And uh, it was Sir Edmund Hillary who came to my school when I was just um, uh, 10 years old. And of course, that was huge inspiration. And um, But what it was, what he was telling us kids is that Mount Everest wasn't high enough for your goals and dreams and aspirations. And of course, years later, uh, when I had achieved Olympic uh, status, uh, I was talking with him and he asked me, would I promise him to inspire the next generation? And I think that's what sort of woke me up to the fact that really, I can do this. I can be like Sir Edmund Hillary and, and inspire others. And I think that's what I agreed to do. I, I said, yes, I will. I will give back to the community and give back to schools and inspire the kids and and uh and wonderfully that's what hamish is doing and all the other great athletes john walker with his field of dreams and i think what it is is that we have really passed the baton back to these kids that are here today and the, the next generation and that's uh very very 
inspiring of, of, uh, to listen to Hamish and his journey and to, uh, you know, Brian Williams, we'll hear from him next week. And that's, that's what it's about. And it's very, very inspiring. I was going to ask you about disappointment because we did the same with Rod. I don't want to let you off. Um, I, I, I know that, that Sydney at 2000 was 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 very tough. And, uh, you know, I've, I've heard at times from people who were close to you at the time, et cetera, that, that it really was a great disappointment. For people who don't know, uh, Hamish was, you know, favoured to do very well in Sydney. And uh, the race, for a range of reasons, didn't, didn't quite go his way. Um, I remember reading about Murray Helbig, who after 1956 actually genuinely went bush. Uh, went down south, put a pack on his back, and and went into the forests. How how did you deal with that disappointment? Because it must have been huge. I'm back. Uh, yeah, it was really difficult, and sometimes we miss when when we see success or when someone does really well. Um, you often see that as a singular point in time. And when you spend time studying people who have been successful, the only common trait they have was a couple of common traits. The first thing is that they all did it slightly differently. Um, that's no real surprise. But the second thing is, is that um, just about every story of uh, someone who's been successful is filled of disappointment. And I think what you've got to accept is that whatever you're going to set out to do, you're going to have periods of time or things that don't go your way and um and there's two things you can do at the at that point when things don't go well um i think there's three really or three really important things the first thing is is that you've got to go into it expecting that to happen because um it's it's your yeah, things aren't, aren't always the way you want them to be they're going to be hard um the second thing is is that um, if you can accept the disappointment and learn from it, it's really the basis for what makes you um, much better because you've turned and faced the disappointment and you've learned more out of that than you would from, say, being successful. Um, and then the third thing is, is as you've said in your question, is um, who are the people around you? So the only guarantee on doing something hard is that you can't do it on your own. So you've got to make sure that you do have a um, really good support network around you. And that can be family and friends, a coach, um, supporters. So relationships are really, really important. And even when you set out to do something, you might not even think that relationship or that relationship is really going to matter until you get to a point where you haven't achieved what you wanted. And you'll find that those relationships are the basis for the ability to learn, grow, and develop into the person you need to become. Because without the disappointment, I mean, you know, if, if you just had a life where you tried to do nothing, you sat in a room all day, you probably wouldn't have a lot of disappointments, but you also wouldn't have much fun either. So by setting goals and trying to achieve something really, really hard, that's when I think you really are living. And the success is not so much in the winning, the success is far more based around your ability to pick yourself up and not give up and keep striving forward. Because, um, yeah, for me personally, that's what I'm more proud of than any gold medal that I've won. It's what I did when I failed that matters to me. And I couldn't have done it with, without having really good people around me, my coach and my family, and looking after them and, you know, having good relationships was, you yeah, vitally important um, and at times I didn't do the relationships justice or didn't put enough time into them so your friends are really really important um, you know look after them be nice to them um, so yeah that's what I would how I'd summarize disappointment and um, yeah trying to get used to it there are some uh, stories out there Hamish about um, some behaviors and of course I have to be careful because some of the people here are children um, but but one of my understandings is that early on in your triathlon career it was really difficult to earn a living 
And we tend to look back at someone like Rod and, 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 and John Walker and Dick Wax and think that they must be making a fortune, uh, or Lorraine and, and Anne and Alison Rowan, people like that on the American circuit. And yet, you know, we find out they were eking it out. They were, they were getting three people to pay for their plane tickets so they could sell two of them and um, things like that. Um, how, how did how did you survive? How did you make it? Because I've heard stories of chasing turkeys across the fields and all sorts. They can't be true. Uh, not so much turkeys, but um, I was on a long ride once and um, and in Europe, and I kind of ran out of money, but I didn't have any money on, on my bike shirt, and so I had to swap my watch for a chicken. Um, <laughs> I was so hungry. <laughs> I was so hungry. I had to eat, and I think the for the more realistically, um, when I came through, and probably the same as Rod, there was no um, national federation to support your journey. You had to kind of raise your own money. And although at the time it was really hard, um, again, the challenges make you into the person you become, and they all add to the mix. And so without that challenge and, and, and the struggle, and the difficulty of um, never having enough money, um, I've come to realize that that's, I needed that journey. I needed my progression to go through that and because I learned so much about how to be organized, how to engage with people and sponsors. So all, these are all the things that I needed. And so again, when you, when you set out to do something difficult or set out to do anything really, um, You've just got to start from the perspective that it's, it, it's going to be really, really challenging. And then deciding you're going to do it anyway, and then you're living. Then you're really doing something amazing because despite the odds, you're still willing to give it a shot. Um, and I really think that's the New Zealand spirit. It's the basis for our country and the success we've had and across sport and business and all areas of um, achieving great things. So, so um, the kids have started off doing a kids marathon and they're, they're keeping a bit of a diary as I said, they're doing it sort of different ways. They, they also, the schoolwork that we give the kids within our schools is really hard um, and uh, it's challenging. We've you, got to work hard at it. Um, what's, what's, uh, Sam, can you mute yourself? We're hearing your chips, man. Uh, <laughs> um, Tell, tell us, tell us about about triathlon because I heard some when I was doing my research for this. I heard you say something really interesting about how the sport changed for for you mid career. Whereas at, at, at one stage, you know, it was a tough swim, a tough bike, and a tough run, and then you, it, it just changed. So, what what's triathlon? What, what if a kid was to go into that sport today? What are they doing? Yeah, so it's um. A lot of you would have seen or heard of, or maybe you've even done a week fix triathlon. Um, you start with a swim, you do a bike, and then you do a run. At your age, you're probably swimming 200 meters. Your bike would maybe be about five kilometers, and you might run uh, one and a half kilometers. Um, going up to the Olympic distance triathlon, that's a one and a half kilometer swim, a 40 kilometer bike, and a 10K run. And like all things, um, triathlon when I started was you know um, a certain type of race where you had to ride on your own on the bike and then it changed to where you could ride next to each other like in the Tour de France so that's like going from an, um, a non-drafting to a drafting race um, I won't go into the details of what that but what it means is you've got to be a slightly different athlete so this was just one of the many kind of obstacles I faced to trying to figure out how to become you know, the best at the sport and you know it is like whether I had that change or not there's still like a you know a thousand piece jigsaw puzzle you've got to sort of get every piece in the right place at the right time and um, it's a lot of problem solving and trying to figure things out um, but yeah that was certainly one thing that came along mid-career that was certainly challenging to try and adapt to. So can we ask I was some of us, some of us have been there, but but most of us haven't. Uh, what's it, what's it like to actually stand on a start line waiting for the hooter to go? And Rod's talked at length about what it was like for him at the beginning of New York when he thought he was in good shape. Um, how do you, how do you how do you feel? Because humans are emotional. Uh, 
how, how do you feel when you're setting out? Yeah, it's um, the first thing I think your natural inclination is to have fear and doubt because you know what's about to happen is going to be really hard and you're not sure if you're ready. <laughs> and um, it's a natural emotion to feel that. And I think um, you get skillful or better at allowing that to wash over you and accepting it. And then once you move through that and you're standing there, then you can start to um, delve into an, a far stronger aspect of trust. Uh, and that's entrusting yourself and your preparation and the team around you. And if you get in, can get into that right mindset where you, you trust starts to bring clarity and confidence, you can start to be there in the moment and not start to worry about all the things that could go wrong because lots of things can go wrong. Uh, generally, the things that go wrong, you don't have a lot of control over. So you, you've also got to learn to let go of those things. And then the confidence really comes from being able to drill down into identifying what you can do and, and not thinking about what all the other things that might happen and, and putting the other things out of your mind. And so that's just the discipline. It takes practice. Um, you've got to, even when you get really, really good at it, you can really easily revert back to feeling un, uncertain and uh, scared and uh, nervous and um, all these opposite emotions. And I think the thing is, it's, again, it's accepting that these are all natural responses. They're not good or bad. Um, but you do want to have a state that you want to be progressing towards and holding yourself there. And then once the race starts, um, generally all that disappears because you're so busy in the race. So uh, it's just about managing that emotion at the start. Did you enjoy the race? Yeah, like, absolutely. I love racing and um, yep. even, yeah, get, having a bad race and trying to get back into the race was really, really challenging. I really enjoyed the challenge of it. Yep. Um, and ultimately, you know, the fitter you were and, sorry, that noise in the background. Um, it was, um, I really enjoyed racing, definitely. Did you enjoy that race? Oh, yeah, that was, I had a, one of the few races where I felt I had, a degree of control, yeah. which is not very common. And I, I knew I was very, very, really well prepared. I didn't know if I was going to win, but I was very confident that if anyone's going to beat me, they were going to have to be exceptional. So, um, and that's a different mindset as well. So um, I just knew that if I put my really, my be very best, if I put out on the course what I was capable of, which I knew I could do, then it was going to be very hard for someone to beat me. So again, like 400 metres from the finish, because I sent the clips out to the kids in that yesterday, and I hope that some of them watched them already, but we'll watch them afterwards. 400 metres from the finish, like everyone else around the world knew that you were going to win. Uh, did you, and how did you feel? I think at that point for me, um, it was very clinical. So you've really really had to um, concentrate really hard on the technical delivery of running fast when you're really tired. It's not, it's not like, it's not an overly emotional, it wasn't an emotional experience. It was, it was just very much, you know, um, to, to run fast when I'm really tired, I really had to concentrate on my position, relaxation, getting my foot hit in the ground properly, relaxing my shoulders, those sort of things which help your body move faster when it's tired. Yeah. Um, and I think until I got to about, you know, five metres from the finishing oh. place, <laughs> um, I let the emotion of the moment come in because I, I was going to win it. And, and when you let that in, it just hits you like an avalanche. You just, yeah, everything you've wanted happens and it just, arrives at that some singular point and it's it's hard to believe but also um it's an amazing feeling um and, and that you know that you know there's a whole lot of people behind you who are right there with you and it means just as much to them as it does to you and as well as the rest of the country there's a there's a little bit of an urban myth around that well, first of all, triathlon had a rule that it couldn't look too difficult as a sport, that you had to stay on your feet and kind of wander off and look as if, and you were lying on your back with, with your arms out and someone suggested you stand up and walk or you suggested something else. 
Did that happen? Um, yeah, it did. So I went across the line and um, um, I fell over. And then this official, because there's lots of officials at the Olympics, that's just the way it is. Um, yeah. um, she came over and sort of tried to pick me up and drag me off. And she sort of told me off. She's like saying, you can't, you can't just lie down in the middle of the, of the race. You're in the yeah. way. You know, do you not do you know that you're on television? So it was it was a bit surreal that that's I remember that for the first thing, but the second thing that I was getting told off for putting for lying down. So anyway, um um it didn't matter. I was like, you know, I was so happy. Yeah, you were the Olympic champion. And I think that's one of the things you mentioned. You've become a dad, so your kids must how old are they now? Uh, my kids are older now, they're um 18 and 21. Wow. Really? Yep. Wow. Wow. Yeah. Yeah. You look far too young. Um. And <laughs> and and. So so what did what did you bring from being being an athlete? I know you're also a smart guy. You've done some, some 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 stuff in the business field. You're doing a great job now. Um. What what did you bring from that to being a dad? Um. What did I take? I've never been asked that before. What did I bring? Um. I think. Well, the, sorry, I'm an, I'm an educator. Hey, I wish I could have known the really. Yeah, yeah. I think I brought a lot of my, um, the way that I was brought up to my own parenting. I was the youngest of five, and mum and dad gave me a lot of space to grow and, and I guess a lot of trust. And, you know, I made a lot of mistakes and stuffed a whole lot of things up. But um, I think the main thing I've, is, is to um, step back and let um, our kids um, fail and try things and fail and, and um, give them the space to figure that out because the reality is, is um, that's an exciting life where you know, learning is very much available uh, all the time because they're trying things and, um, and also, I guess, just unconditional love. Um, and yeah, just just the autonomy to to make be able to make decisions for their life, and even if it looks like a really really bad decision, um, yeah, you come to realise that it's it's sort of up to them. I mean, our kids are older now, so uh, but even when they were younger, uh, we often tried to give them the space to learn as much as possible. Yeah, I mean, I've often said to people one of the toughest things for and Karen and I being parents was that our oldest chose not to study after school for, for 18 months. And it was really difficult not to say, you know, and, and the phone call that we got one day uh, when it was actually in the United States saying, I'm going to college was, was, a, was a huge relief. I, I think it's amazing advice. Um, probably I'll, I'll, I'll check the questions in a sec, but the last one that I had, um, who, who would, because I know New Zealand won an Olympic medal last year, and I feel he's kind of been under, under, under I don't know, if New Zealand public don't quite know about him enough. So who should the kids look up to today now in terms of an Olympic triathlete? Well, there's a new, um, there's an athlete who's about 22 years old who won a bronze medal in Tokyo called Hayden Wild. Uh, Hayden is, uh, and, uh, is, is relatively new to the sport. But he's incredible, um, incredible young man who works incredibly hard. He's incredibly independent, and he's kind of found the sport, or the sports found him. And he's just a, he's a very natural uh, racer. He really loves. So I think if you want someone who's you know close to your age but an amazing young man is Hayden Wild. I would definitely look him up and follow him and. He's got, uh, he's on a really steep learning journey as well. And he's someone who's very willing to share, you know, uh, his story and what he's learned. And he's still only just getting started. So he's a pretty amazing guy. He, he's also like Rod, I think would know of him as well. He's also a track runner, isn't he? Yeah, he's a very good track runner. Yeah. And he's sort of taken triathlon running to a whole nother level, which is you're not easy to do, and he's an incredible athlete. Um, has someone, you know, oh, sorry, sorry, in, in my, my follow-up question there, on, on the woman's side, is there someone who, who should, I mean, because boys can follow girls and girls can follow boys, but as a mix, 
who, who on the woman's side is coming through for New Zealand that, that our kids can follow? I think the athlete that would be um, really great to keep an eye on is uh, Nicole Van der Kay. Um, if you just write Nicole and then Van, V-A-N, um, it's D-E-R, and you'll find her. And so she is also was at the Olympics in uh, Tokyo. And she's been doing the sport for a few years now, but still very young. And again, a really impressive young, young woman who's uh, incredibly hard worker and has overcome a lot of obstacles to get to where she is actually. And, just, and she's just getting started. So she's a, um, yeah, someone that would be really inspirational for the young, for the young kids to follow. Cool. And is this a sport you'd still, I mean, given all your experiences and all of the changes, this is a sport you'd still recommend kids get into? Oh, look, absolutely. Um, but ahead of that, I would encourage any sport provides amazing opportunities to learn and grow as a young person. And it's, um, it may be triathlon, it could be running. It's, it's just, yeah, just pick something and just get stuck in. Um, remember, sport is all about enjoyment and challenging yourself and making friends and um, and learning a whole lot of stuff. So that's what it's really about. Cool. So I've asked quite a few accumulated questions. Does anyone else out there have have something something quick to ask? Um, or anything from you, Rod, because I know you've been a, an interested observer. No, all good. So, hey, Hamish, thank you so much for your time. And uh, I, I actually can't believe your kid's that old. I can remember seeing them running around. <laughs> uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, down, the new, really down the new market pools um, <laughs> and getting, 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 Rick Wells giving them a hard time. Um, so, so thank you so much for your time. And, and I'm going to say one of the things I've always appreciated was or uh, well, two things. One was uh, the gesture you made to to our mutual friend Jack Rolston by taking your Olympic medal up to Jack when he was ill in the hospital and saying yeah. uh, he'd only come out with uh, the medal or not at all. <laughs> yeah, and that I know that meant a tremendous amount for Jack and, uh, and and for the community that was supporting Jack. And the other thing will seem more trivial, but um, every time you were at a race and kids would come up and see you and say good day and ask for an autograph, uh, I never saw you without a smile on your face. And, uh, but, you know, I think it was very impressive. And you have inspired a uh, tremendous amount of people um, and uh, appreciate it. Yeah, my pleasure. Really nice to see you all. Um, and, you know, as, um, as Rod said at the start, the exciting thing uh, is about if you can give something back to inspire the next person, it's kind of um, how we roll in New Zealand and it's really exciting to be able to. Thank you. What are you trying? Are you, are you going for a cycle around the velodrome now? No, no, I've got to go back to work, but um, um, they are on the velodrome as we speak, so I, I, I couldn't get a room, so I'm sitting out here on the, on the bleachers, but it's all good. Well, thank you so much. Okay, thanks a lot. See you all. Bye. Very cool. All good, Rod? Yeah, that was very, very inspiring, Alan, and, and um, it's going to be a great, a great recording for people to go through and and uh, I would say analyze it, but go through it and take each each answer that Hamish had uh, and and read it again and again. Um, you never stop learning, and uh, that was very very inspiring and incredible that uh, along the same lines that we all went through. I mean, I followed and. Uh, uh, after uh, uh, Barry McGee and Peter Snell and Murray Helberg and I had an incredible journey with uh, John Walker and Dick Quacks and Tony Polhill um, and Hamish had the same journey with his people and the people that he surrounded and the people that were part of his life was so very important and I think that's the key is don't forget the people around you your, your friends, the people that have helped you, your teachers, your parents, uh, your neighbours, all the people who are really in support of you, and don't forget to reach out to them. It's just incredible. Great, great, great uh, time that we had with Hamish. 
Cool. And one thing I would mention just as we close, uh, the first time I actually shook Rod's hand or met Rod, apart from the autograph when I was about, I don't know, 10, was uh, Rod was one of the, the key speakers at the great Jack Rolson funeral. And uh, Hamish was there and spoke, spoke as well. And uh, that, I think that community, that tribute to Jack was a part of it as well. And uh, seriously, in terms of contributions, that they could probably still be telling stories today. So, so um, yeah. Hey, thank you for your time. Um, thank you, people. And they are recorded. I remember just in time. Um, and um, to those that are out there, I'm still working through all of the marking. It is amazing. I'm so impressed. And we'll catch up soon. Thanks, guys. Thank See you, Rob. Bye.